So thank you for coming to this uh, session. It's actually uh, fairly exciting to, uh, to give a talk uh, physically in conferences. I haven't done that uh, in a while. It's all about uh, lately Zoom squares and giving uh, talks this way is not as exciting. And so uh, I'm much more nervous than usual. So my name is Pavel. Uh, here's a slide to show a few things that I've uh, recently done. I've written a few books. Uh, they're available on Amazon. Please buy them. They make me money. So go ahead. You can do that. Um, as you can see, the word Windows is uh, there uh, quite a bit. So you might guess that I probably like Windows uh, to some extent. And unfortunately, I do. So this is just uh, some of the things that I do. I usually uh, write code. I uh, provide training for, uh, for companies and, uh, and write books when I have time. I also have a set of uh, open source tools you can find on my GitHub repository. So they're all open source. You can see what's going on there. And I have a website where I just uh, log from time to time when I'm uh, really, really bored. So I guess that's uh, enough about me. Just go ahead and uh, uh, Google if you want some more. OK, so we'll start with a brief overview of uh, C++20, what's going on uh, in the language. And uh, apparently this microphone. Uh, has some issues. And then we'll discuss the four big things, uh, starting with concepts, kind of get us uh, into the C++ stuff that is new to uh, C++ 20 and actually is then in every other aspect, or so most of the other aspects in C++ 20. We'll then look at the ranges and see what they bring to the table. Uh, after that, we'll look at the coroutines, which I uh, heard you had a session yesterday. Uh, but still, this is uh, my favorite feature uh, for sure uh, in C++20. I think it was sorely missing for many years. And then we'll, uh, we'll end with the modules, which is a fairly uh, much simpler feature, at least in, in concept. OK, so let's begin. Uh, so we know that C++ uh, has been evolving, especially since C++11. We get many, many features. And C++ was doing some form of catch up uh, with other languages. And most developers today, I think, work with more than one language at a time, and not only C++ developers. We're using other languages because we want to usually use the, the best tool for the job that we, that we need to do. And so uh, one of the things that is, uh, well, kind of concerning to me uh, as, as I'm doing quite a bit of training is how to teach C++. I think C++ has grown to be a very big language, one of the biggest uh, that I at least know of. And uh, it's very difficult to, to get started, I think, because of the multi-paradigms that we have in C++. So if you have someone that's just starting out, should you teach him uh, or him or her to use a new and delete? I mean, would that be a good idea? Or maybe you should just stick to the smart pointers and all these things and say, well, that's not a good idea to use new and delete. And the problem is that if you stick to the new stuff, then that someone might encounter old code that still uses new delete or other concepts that are less uh, used today in more than C++, and that might baffle that someone. So I think one of the important aspects of C++ today is the ability to have guidelines. We need some uh, guidelines that uh, are necessary in order to write modern code correctly. And we know that already these things exist. Uh, we can find those on, on GitHub and in other uh, locations. Uh, because really, writing C++ well is not, is not easy. And it's not always, uh, we don't, don't always know exactly what's the best approach. Because there's so many ways in doing uh, something which is, might be similar. So C++ 20, uh, in particular, is a very big release. There's a lot of stuff there. And uh, this session, this talk is just about the big four uh, things in C++20. There are many small features, but very useful. But this talk is not about those. So like I said, essentially, C++ is very big. And even I, that I've been using C++ on and off for more than 25 years, probably, I still find the, the language pretty complex. Uh, in some cases, I think the language is complex. Uh, and that's why. Uh, it's not very easy to get into the language. And this is something that I, I worry about. It's much easier to get into many other languages that have a lower bar of, uh, uh, of entry. And if you just want to be convinced of that, just read the standards, C++ standards. I mean, it's almost worse than the Intel manuals. <laughs> so I 
guess uh, <laughs> let's see there's another one here so maybe I'll, I'll use the another one and uh, I don't have enough challenges right now <laughs> so let's try this way okay let's turn that off okay so Hopefully, that will be better now, and I'll survive this talk. So let's start with the first uh, concept, which is, well, concepts. So concepts is something that was very kind of missing uh, in C++. It was always possible to do something that uh, mimics the idea of concepts, but if you have written that in, in the, the way it was done prior to C++20, that would be very hard to read and, and to understand. So the problem is, is that uh, when we write a generic code, we use templates, which is very common to do in C++, of course. Um, there's really no way to know in the classic sense what exactly does the template function or template type expect. So here's the classic uh, sort algorithm that is part of the standard library. And this sort says that it accepts uh, something called an iterator, which uh, just uh, by the name, I may guess that it actually requires an iterator, uh, but even that is, well, it's, it's, not, it's not saying that in any explicit way. And so what kind of iterators or what kind of types this template accepts? And the, in prior to C++20, there's no good way of saying that, which means that I don't know if this works for whatever I'm trying to do. So if I try to sort a vector, for example, then I have a vector, I provide the, the, in the begin iterator and the end iterator to the sort algorithm, and that works, great, I'm very happy. But then I decide that I need to sort a list, and if I do that, uh, the compiler is not very happy. It's going to give me an error, and usually I get these incomprehensible long template-like errors that you've probably seen uh, for every compiler, and then you're trying to, uh, what does, what's wrong? What's going on? Why isn't that compiling? I mean, it requires an iterator. I give it an iterator. I'm good. It looks like it requires an iterator. Of course, I don't know that for sure. It's just the name is iterator. And of course, we're, those that have been around in C++ know the problem here because the sort algorithm requires a certain iterator. It requires a random access iterator that has certain properties and if those properties don't exist on the iterator, the salt algorithm just can't work. And unfortunately, the list uh, container doesn't support uh, uh, that kind of iterator. It only supports a bidirectional iterator, which is a, a, a weaker type of iterator. But I didn't really know that, and there's no way to guess that from the, the way this uh, algorithm or function is defined. And that's really the problem. When we write functions in C++ before C++20, we have two types of functions. One of them is the standard function that is very specific. So it works on very specific types. So here's an example of an is prime function that returns true for, uh, for numbers that are prime numbers, but it accepts an integer, just an integer. So it's very specific, it's very easy to understand, it's very explicit. We know what the function expects, we know what the function uh, can uh, return and everything is kind of clear. However, we want to write generic code in many cases so we can write less code because sometimes you might want to see whether uh, a prime number is uh, maybe a long long is a prime number uh, as a type or maybe we have some big integer that uh, someone has created that we want to be able to use in exactly the same way. So. <laughs> When we have C++ functions they're, that are written this way, they're very explicit. On the other hand, we can, uh, we can have these generic functions. So generic functions. Okay. <laughs> okay, it's good now, I hope. So when we write a generic code, fully generic code, this is what we get. So we write something about uh, is prime of t, and there's again no information about what t really is, or what valid t's are acceptable to this function. And that's the, the problem that concepts tries to solve. 
So uh, there's another way, by the way, to write template code uh, in C++20, which is uh, just a shortcut for the previous example, where we can use just auto. So this auto thing means that this is completely, this is generic in just the same way. You just don't have to write this template, type name, and all this uh, uh, ceremony that we have to write uh, before C++20. So this is unrelated to concept. This is just one nice feature that's uh, kind of good to know. So when we test is prime, this particular implementation that is the template implementation, uh, we test these things with the uh, values or types that make sense, then we get uh, proper results. But if you try something different like testing with a double, then we get some uh, error message. The compiler says, well, I, I don't know how to do something, and I've actually shortened the error message here because it was very long in my uh, compiler, so I just uh, kind of bring, brought you the, the gist of it. And there's two things that it finds wrong here. The percent, the module operator, doesn't seem to be working. And SQRT doesn't seem to be uh, uh, appropriately available for the type in question. And so if you try something very, very bizarre, again, that will not work. And, and the, again, the problem is there's no documentation here. If you just see the prototype of the function, you don't have the implementation necessarily. You don't need to care about the implementation. If you just want to use the function, you have no idea which types are acceptable to that function. And this is where concepts come in. So the basic idea of concepts is to provide constraints on template parameters. So now when you have these constraints, you know which types are acceptable to the function or class or whatever uh, template thing you're trying, you're trying to make. And as a side benefit, the errors the compiler provides in case you provide a type which is not a good match are almost comprehensible. So we can actually understand what the problem is in most cases rather than having these long-winded uh, crazy strings. So here's how to write a concept. A concept is written with a new keyword called concept where you specify the concept name and then uh, you have the equals sign, and then you provide some expression that, uh, that represents the, what this concept means. So it's uh, like writing a, a, a template, but you, uh, this time you talk about what the type should be. So here's one example. I'm creating a concept here called integral, and that concept is uh, representing a type which is an integral type. So I'm using here one of these uh, templates that exist in the standard library in type uh, traits a header and of course there are many of those and we can create a concept in this way this is just kind of the the simplest thing we can do so once we do that then uh, we can write is prime differently instead of just having that as a generic template that can be anything now we can see the type itself is integral so that's one way of writing it we can see that now it is integral and the compiler will report anything that is not an integral and will not allow us to compile the code, but the error message is going to be clear. It's going to say, hey, that doesn't fulfill the concept integral as specified in the function. So we're not using type name anymore, we're using integral, using the concept uh, itself. And so now when we try to use that with a type that doesn't make sense for something like is prime, then we get a very, uh, a very comprehensible, relatively speaking, uh, error message that says, hey, something is not satisfied here, and usually, depending on the compiler, you get even the exact uh, info detail that tells you what is exactly wrong there. So on the one hand, it tries to first find uh, an overload, because it is possible to have another is prime that accepts a double specifically. Maybe there is such a thing. So it's trying to find a low overload first because uh, that's going to be very specific. But if it can't find that, it tries to uh, fall back to the generic case and then see if that works based on the types we provide. So this makes uh, writing generic code more uh, understandable, at least for those using gen the generic code because they know what to expect. So this is the idea. So let's try to kind of expand on that a little bit. So uh, here's the is prime function, of course, but we can write that uh, in a different way, just to show you some more options. So the first option is the thing that we've seen previously, but the second option here uses integral auto n. So this is just exactly the same thing, but without the ceremony of template, integral, and so on. This is, a, again, a feature of C++ 
plus 20 that allows you uh, to write things in this way. So the auto here really means anything, but it must conform to the concept that is specified here, integral. And so these uh, constraints, like I said, in pre-C++20, we could use, could write those using uh, enable if in all these crazy meta uh, template meta programming uh, things that some people like very much. I know that some people like that for whatever reason. Uh, but uh, w when you write these things, it looks like the head of, of a function looks like something, I don't know, it's, it's too crazy for me. Uh, and so concepts makes it a bit better at least, or a lot better perhaps. So that's uh, another way to write exactly the same thing. And here's yet another way, just to show you the, the variant, so you know that these are all essentially the same. What we have here is template, but it has this requires clause. And the requires clause is uh, another way to, uh, to extend the way we define a concept, which I'll show you that in one of the, uh, in the next, some of the next slides. But in general, you can write things in this way. This is less, um, less I would say, used, but it is legal, it is valid, because I'm saying, hey, you, it works for any T, but really not any T. T is requires to conform to this particular, uh, to this particular concept. So again, this is the same thing, just different ways of writing that. So uh, another example, why not? Here's something which is fully generic. I'm taking that is prime example from, uh, from the previous slides, and I'm expanding that by creating a function called the uh, count primes. And count primes takes uh, uh, two values and counts the number of prime numbers in the range from uh, first to last. And so I can write this in this way, in a very generic way, without using any concepts. And that would, well, work for types that are uh, kind of, uh, would, would, would uh, work for this particular case based on whatever I'm using. We can write that differently. Uh, like I said uh, earlier, we can use this uh, concept of just writing auto. Writing auto is the same as writing templated code, however, if you look at these two pieces of code, they're not exactly identical. So they're not semantically equivalent. And anybody sees why? Yep. Exactly, so the, the thing is that on the left, we have type T, and type T is the one of for first and last, which means it has to be the same type. On the right side, we have auto and auto, which means that first and last don't have to actually be the same type. It should also, of course, it eventually has to compile, it has to be convertible to something that the compiler can make sense of, but they don't actually have to be the same type. So it's not exactly the same, because now we have two parameters, just to, to note that small difference. With concepts, of course, the same idea is applied, but now uh, we can use uh, integral there as the, the template parameter, which means that we're now focusing only on integral types and not on something else. And again, we can write that in essentially a similar way using this integral auto. That's a new syntax in C20 that allows us to write these kinds of things. And again, just like with the previous case, these are not semantically the, uh, equivalent because the templates there could be two different integrals. Could be an int and long and all these things or big int or whatever uh, that uh, conforms to the concept. But here it must be the, the same type. So in general, what we want to do today when you write generic code, what you want is to add concepts. You want to add constraints because it's very unlikely that you have something that can work on any type. So there are such things. All the containers, for example, they work on any type or almost any type. Uh, but usually, you're more constrained. And that's very important. I remember I encountered that first in, in .NET. I was using .NET quite a bit. In 2005, .NET 2 came along and there was generic programming there introduced into .NET, uh, but constraints were immediately there. And so if you had a, a generic function there, it couldn't do any, almost anything except calling methods from the base object class or something like that. You couldn't do anything unless you added constraints and say, hey, that T, that type can conform to this and that and that, and I need these things to, in order to perform operations. And so, .NET is implemented very differently in terms of generics versus C++ templates, and it's not really part of, of, of this talk, but I'm just saying this is a very important uh, 
thing that is now part of C++. So uh, what else? Many concepts are already defined by the standard library. And of course, it's uh, best to use them when you need them. And you can combine concepts to create higher level concepts or more specific concepts or more unique concepts depending on what you're trying to do. So the concept header has these uh, concepts uh, defined. You can also overload functions based on concepts. So you can say there's a function that accepts a concept integral, but maybe there's another function that accepts a different concept or uses a very particular type. That's fine. The compiler will always try to find the most constrained match, the, the best match that it can, and we, and we go then to more generic stuff if it can't find something which is precisely what, what you ask for. So we can combine concepts. Here's an example. I'm creating another concept here called unsigned integral. I'm taking my integral concept, which I've defined already, and I can use the AND and also the OR operator uh, is also supported uh, to say that an unsigned integral is an integral and something which is not signed. And again, I'm taking something from the, uh, the type traits uh, header. And by the way, this, uh, this particular concept are already defined, so please don't define them. Okay, I've defined them just for demonstration purposes. The concepts header already has those, uh, but you can in general take existing content, concepts and build on top of them. And I really recommend you do that instead of trying to start from scratch. There's no need in, in most cases to do that. So we can combine them in this way. That's one thing. And so uh, if we take that kind of step further, because the is prime function doesn't really work with negative numbers, not something that is something we don't really do, then I can be more specific now and say that, in fact, I want to accept as an unsigned integral to the is prime function, nothing, uh, nothing else, because this is more precise. So I want to be as precise as possible to prevent errors, to prevent errors and to make uh, my intent more explicit. It's very kind of understandable. So here's just a, a deep, yeah. You mean the arguments to the function? No. No, so this is just to, for defining a concept that you can use the concept as is. But you can create a, as, as complex as expression as you wish to, to build the concept itself. So here's just a partial list to give you a sense of the concepts already existing in the, in the standard library. Uh, so it's already there. You can define things that are default constructible, for example, or move constructible, all these things. Because sometimes you know there are some cases where you say, well, I need this to be to have a default constructor because I need to create that from time to time. So how can you express that? Now you can. You have these concepts that are already there, available for you. You can combine them with the AND operator or the OR operator and with the requires clause that I'll show uh, in the next slide. So this is just uh, a partial list of what is provided uh, by the standard library. By the way, notice iterators. I mentioned at the beginning we saw that thing with the sort algorithm, and now we have specific concepts for various types of iterators. So now we could be more explicit and say that the sort algorithm requires a random access iterator. It doesn't work with other less powerful iterators. It requires at least that thing. So now it actually should work better and the compiler should give us a more comprehensible uh, error message if you use that in C++20. So one, another way to extend or to, uh, to define concepts in a more rich way is using the requires clause. I want to show you what that looks like, what we can do with it. So with the requires clause, we can have much more granular um, information set up to define our concept. So here's an example for a concept called number. And that concept uses the requires clause. So I'm writing concept, the name of the concept, equal sign, that is kind of required. And then I can do either just write some expression or use requires, and it's also possible, of course, to combine those, but use requires and do and and or with other concepts that exist. So it must be a single expression, but we can combine this to any, uh, to any level of nesting even. So with this example, what we have here is a concept that's saying for any A and B of type T, we require that uh, 
uh, that these things hold. So A plus B, the expression A plus B must, must return something which is convertible to T. And convertible to T is yet another concept that says, hey, this is something that we can convert to T. The compiler is able to find a proper conversion. And so we have here these requirements of the type T. The type T must support addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, must support all these things. Otherwise, it won't be able to, we won't be able to pass the appropriate value to, the, uh, to whatever template is using this concept. So this is very powerful because we can be very explicit, uh, not just in generic ways such as something that which is default constructible, but something more specific than that. So now uh, we can do that uh, in, in several ways. Uh, so here's another example of, uh, of defining a very simple iterator. What does it actually mean to be an iterator? So we know that there are various types of iterators, but here's kind of something like the, the basic iterator perhaps. So again, we define a concept called iterator and we have requires and here's T of, uh, that's the type and IT would be our name, like the, the variable uh, in a sense. And then we can have more options. So the first line says that there must be a nested type within T that is called value type. That is required. If you want to be an iterator, you must provide this thing. Otherwise, you're not an iterator. But it's not enough. You also have to provide a plus plus operator. And that should return something which is convertible to T, to that iterator type. And then there's another thing. You have to implement a dereference operator. And that should return something which is convertible to that type name. So that, sorry, the value type, the value type which is inside the iterator type. So this is very explicit. You can think of that as just an interface. This is an interface in a kind of the logical concept of what it means to be a, an interface. Do you have to mention the type name twice? Yes, you do. So hopefully, um, not many people would need to write concepts, but if you do need to write them, you can. It's not too bad. It might look a bit uh, verbose perhaps uh, in some sense. But it's not too bad, and it's very easy to understand. If you try to write it in the old way, if it's all possible, if these things could even be written in that way, that would be incomprehensible, at least to me. And so when we see this thing, when we have this type available as part of various functions and classes, it's very understandable what we expect. And of course, we can build on that and say, hey, what is a bidirectional iterator? So you can take B direction iterator and say that's iterator and requires and the extra stuff that is required to be a B directional iterator. Yeah. Yes. So hopefully yes. That depends on the compiler. Right now, uh, the the Visual C++ compiler is not too explicit about that. It says the concept is not fulfilled. It's not saying which member is problematic, but the, the, the Clang profile, uh, compilers that I've seen in GCC as well saying, hey, this is the thing that you missed, which is very, very understandable, and this is the way it should be. So Visual C++ has a few more things to do in order to make this uh, better. But the compiler is able to do that because the information is there. It doesn't, the compiler doesn't need to guess. It's, it's all there. Um, and so now if I create my own iterator, I decide to create an iterator, I need to conform to, uh, to conform to the concept. So how do I do that? How do I know that my type that I'm creating, that iterator actually is a true iterator? How can I test that um, in, in kind of an easy way, a relatively easy way? So what I recommend you do is use static assert. So with static assert, I can say, hey, static assert, iterator, my iterator, please check whether my iterator confirms to being an iterator. So I can get these errors in compile time very easily. This is like a, a very kind of simple unit testing kind of way to see whether my types that I'm creating really conform to an iterator uh, before I get the actual uh, specific error messages. This is just something you can use and you can use several values or, or types to see whether you actually get the concept right. So here's another example. If you want to take that, well, a few steps further, I'm not sure it's a good idea, but I'm showing you that this is possible. 
So we know that there's this classic uh, example that apparently uh, was created some, sometime in the 1960s with these uh, shapes and the polymorphism that we're all familiar with. So here's the classic example uh, used in C++. We have a base class, an abstract base class called shape, and it has uh, several pure virtual functions that represent uh, its uh, kind of properties or behavior. And then we have various types deriving from that shape and override whatever uh, methods that we want. And we can create that kind of uh, class hierarchy. This is like uh, C++ 101 uh, uh, kind of, but, uh, uh, and it's very easy to use. I mean, we've done that probably many times. And uh, most languages provide this kind of facility of runtime polymorphism, where we have a V table behind the covers and we have that indirect call to whatever uh, function we're trying to, uh, to use. And uh, although this works fine, and I'm not saying you shouldn't use that, polymorphism definitely has its, uh, its place, um, but there are some things that may ha perhaps might be uh, maybe not ideal here. Uh, so uh, here's how I would use this thing. Maybe I want to have a, a vector of various uh, shapes. So the way I have to do that is to use pointers uh, behind the covers for polymorphism to work correctly. And so I have a vector of unique pointer of shape, and then I can uh, push back and add shapes to that by creating new, new shapes for, with the concrete types. And then of course I can go ahead and draw all of these shapes or do whatever I want to do with these shapes very easily using that uh, polymorphic call. So this works and this is, uh, is definitely uh, okay, but it's not ideal. Uh, all these uh, make unique means that I have some uh, heap allocation. Heap allocations are more expensive than using the stack, for example, um, and, and maybe class hierarchy is also something which is uh, creating a dependency. Maybe I want to have a different shape that doesn't really uh, inherit from shape and it's not really convenient to do so. So I can't really put that or plug that into that kind of system. So we can write these things uh, with templates. And of course we could do that uh, for many years, it's nothing new, but now with concepts we can be very explicit about what we require of that T thing. So here's an example uh, that would do that. So here's a, a, a concept called shape. So what does it mean to be a shape? So a shape is something that has this method called get and that should return something that is convertible to color, let's say color is enumeration, and it must have a method called draw. If that something satisfies these two constraints, so two conditions, this is a shape. I don't care what it inherits from. I don't care about that at all. I just care that it has these particular uh, members. So this is what requires, allows us to do, to be very, very explicit and very uh, verbose about that. So now I can have a class like rectangle and ellipse, and they both conform to being shapes, even though they don't need to, uh, to inherit from anything in particular or be connected any other way. Uh, so the S here, uh, that it, this is re just required as part of the syntax, that's kind of the object. So you're saying the object uh, has uh, the method uh, get color. You might ask why do you need the word template here? This is just part of the syntax, unfortunately. So just have to use that as is. It's like the template in S. I, well, you can think of that in any way that uh, makes you comfortable, uh, but that's just uh, the syntax that you, you have to use. Uh, so uh, that's because we use something very simple like operators which don't require that. So it's, uh, it's mostly syntax stuff, which is not always, uh, it's usually because to, to help compilers uh, have an easier time compiling stuff. It's like, why do you have to add type name in nested types? I mean, why do you have to do that? We have to do that for, for the compilers to, to have an easier time compiling C++ code because it's so difficult. Uh, so maybe we shouldn't have that, but we do. So not, nothing really that uh, critical there. So here, for example, I decide that I want to create the circle class by deriving from ellipse. I decide that this is a good idea because it just makes my life easier perhaps, but it doesn't really matter because I don't require any sort of derivation, although I could have done that. So it's possible to say requires something that derives from something else. This is yet another thing we can add, but in this case, I don't need that. 
And again, I'm using here a static cursor to test my uh, shapes to, to make sure that they actually never break. So if someone later on decides, let's change the class rectangle, I want that to break very early, saying, hey, that's uh, an assertion failure. So here's a polygon class that I try to perhaps uh, uh, masquerade as a shape, but it doesn't work because it has get color, but it doesn't have draw, so that doesn't work, and static assert will fail, and, and without even me creating any instances of polygon just yet. I failed that very early before actually using that class anywhere. So uh, how do we use this thing? I mean, in the previous case with polymorphism, it's fairly easy. We have a vector of the base type uh, with unique pointer or shared pointer or whatever, and then we simply uh, uh, add those uh, shapes uh, onto it, but what now? Can we use a vector here? That's probably not going to work very well because vector requires some form of of a base type, and we don't have that kind of requirement here, so vector will probably not work. So unfortunately, we have to, well, I'm saying unfortunately, but it could be not unfortunate, it really depends on your perspective, but we have to go to more templates. So here's a draw shape function. So this draw shape function accepts a shape auto. So shape auto, again, is a way to say what I require here is something that conforms to the concept shape. So this is a templated function, uh, instead of writing template uh, type name T and then requires shape T, which is I could have done as well, this is just a shorthand of doing that. So I can call the draw function. Of course, that would always work because I can only accept shapes into this function. So I can do something very simple. I create these objects like a circle or ellipse or rectangle or whatever and call draw shape. That's understandable, fairly easy. And the compiler will make sure that I conform uh, to the concept. What about having a collection of objects, that's uh, more, uh, I would say, challenging. And uh, the way to do that uh, is to use, unfortunately, some template metaprogramming. So like I said, template metaprogramming, some people re really like it, some people hate it. And I think there are very few people that are kind of indifferent, but most people have some, some extreme thought about uh, template metaprogramming is very cool or something to avoid at all costs. So fortunately, I can't have avoid it here. So here's the draw all function, and the draw all functions can't, can't really work with the vector, it's going to work with the tuple. And because tuple accepts variadic agreements, which means it can accept any number of, of arguments of types, and it doesn't really care uh, which, because it just uh, is a collection of, of objects on, with various types, essentially, we need to write uh, the draw all function in, in a template metaprogramming way. So we have some recursion here, this is the the normal uh, way of working with template metaprogramming, you usually have this uh, compile time recursion, you need some, some stop condition, of course, like any good recursion. So this is what happens here. I have the, this tuple, and then I'm looking at the index, which is the parameter here, which is a, just a number. If it's uh, the size of the number of items, then I'm done, because there's no more items in the tuple. Otherwise, I can call draw shape with a particular index, because the get, uh, the get method here, the get function, requires something which is compile time. It can't work with anything that is runtime. So index is a compile time thing because it is uh, part of that template. So I'm calling draw uh, shape there, and then uh, recursively calling draw all with the next index. So the way to to uh, to work with that is simply to call that with the uh, with index zero, perhaps. So now I can create a multitude of shapes here and store them in a tuple. I don't have to allocate them on the I can allocate them anywhere that I want, and then I can call draw all here. And you might be wondering what would happen if I want to add stuff to that. I mean, vector is a dynamic container. We can add stuff to that. What about tuple? Can we add things to a tuple? So not really, uh, but we can do that. We can create new tuples based on an existing tuple. So here's an example of how to do that. We're using the tuple cut um, function where we can take uh, any number of arguments and build a new tuple out of it, and if there's an existing tuple, it's going to be decomposed to its parts. So I'm taking shapes here, which is already there, that's the existing tuple, and adding another uh, ellipse uh, to, that, uh, to that list of shapes, uh, if you will, and calling draw all again. So that would be my new tuple, so to speak. And everything is uh, perfectly forwarded there, so it's, uh, it's, it's very uh, cheap to, to do. So you can do that. I'm not saying you should do that, but I'm saying you could do that. Um, and so it gives you more power when you have concepts. Um, and of course, with 
template metaprogramming with variadic templates and so on, you can, you can do that, uh, even though it might not be as easy. But hopefully, uh, most people that would write this kind of code, they would write the, the library, someone would write that library, and all the others would simply use that. So it will be proper, uh, proper wrapper functions to do these things uh, in an easier way. Uh, so I'll, we'll keep uh, questions to the end, okay? Just to, to make sure I cover everything I want to cover, I'll, I'll, we'll have some time uh, at the end for questions. So that's the basic idea of concepts. So some generic guidelines. So first, there are lots of concepts, as I mentioned, in the standard library. Use them whenever possible. You don't have to use them as is. You can combine them uh, with other concepts that you create. Um, that's one thing. The second thing is just to as a syntactic uh, thing that I mentioned previously, usually you shouldn't use requires. The best way is to simply use the concept, auto, and the variable name. That's uh, easy to write and easy to understand without the, the ceremony uh, of template and so on. Usually concept will be defined by those writing libraries for others to use. So I don't expect everyone to be writing concepts now go go to work and they say, well, let's, let's write some concept. Usually someone has to, uh, to deal with that, to create concepts that make sense in the domain that you're working in. So it's not that easy uh, because it's, well, it's easy to write concepts, but it's not that easy to write good concepts that represent something meaningful, something abstract, uh, but, but specific enough to, to make sense to have that as a concept. And so you should not write concepts just because you can, and, but write them if they make sense to the domain you're working with, and it would probably benefit other developers and other parts of your system, not, not th something that is not too specific for a very specific use case. Okay, so that's concepts. That's the first uh, item in the big four items in C++ 20. So without further ado, let's move on to the next. And the next one is ranges. So what is ranges? Ranges is, in fact, a concept unto itself. And there is a bunch of, uh, uh, of them defined in the STD ranges and namespace. And the basic idea of a range is to have something to iterate over. So definitely, uh, we can think of uh, containers as being ranges, and they are. Uh, but there are other things we can do with ranges. So um, most algorithms that you know from the algorithm headers, such as sort and many others, have overloads that accept ranger uh, instead of these two uh, pairs, the, the pair of iterators that we know. So here's a very simple example. If I want to sort something like a vector, I can use the classic algorithm, just call uh, sort with begin and end for that vector, and that of course works, that's perfectly fine. But with ranges, we can do something simpler and saying sort just, here's your container, here's the, the range, just sort that and that's it. And it doesn't seem to be a very kind of big deal. I mean, ah, you just uh, maybe save a little typing, but is that really a big deal? So first we have this intent. The intent is clear. What I want to do here is to sort this, uh, this range. That's what I want to do. With begin and end, it's not really clear. And it also uh, prevents me from making mistakes. For example, providing a different iterator from a different container. And because iterators are iterators, I don't know what's going to happen there. The compiler will be happy to, uh, to work with that, but I don't know what the result would be. And so that's uh, one thing, but of course it's a very simple thing. There are some other overloads to sort that provide us more options for customizing the algorithm itself. So that's kind of nice, but we want something more. And uh, the more part are views. So views are really the thing that makes ranges uh, very useful. Um, so what is a view? A view provides uh, some form of operation over a range or other views. And this adds to C++ something that was kind of sorely missing, which is a functional style of programming. In functional style, you work with functions and combine functions uh, in a very intuitive way. You're doing something, and then you're doing another something, another something, another something and you get something that you want, and, and this is really uh, comfortable for, uh, very convenient for many cases. If you've used other languages, such as C Sharp, or, or Python, or Rust, these things exist there, and they were existed there kind of very early uh, in the language, relatively speaking. 
In C++, we have it now. Another, uh, another aspect of views, they never own their elements. So they can work with the elements, but they're never the owners of the elements. And they're lazily evaluated, which means that when you apply some form of view over a view or a range, you get back an object that knows how to do the work, but the work has not been done yet. Only when you start to iterate or take items of that view, only then the operation starts to, to be actually being performed, which is important. Uh, important to understand that. Sometimes you want that, sometimes you might not want that, but at least it's important to know this is the way it works. So um, what we can do with views, because of that functional style, is to chain them together. We can use normal functions to, uh, to make the chain, or an easier way is to use the pipe, the OR operator. It's not really OR, it's like chaining. So it's operator overloading that is being done uh, behind the scenes, so it's more intuitive to kind of make the, the, the leap to the next uh, view and so on. So let's just uh, see a few examples. Every view is a range, by the way, but not vice versa, uh, because, for example, a container is a range, but it's not a view because it, uh, it, owns, uh, it owns its elements. So here's some examples. Here's a vector of numbers, and I have a display function here that simply uh, displays uh, a range. So notice I'm using the range concept here. So there is a concept called range, and I'm using range auto, which means I accept anything that conforms to the concept of being a range, such as a view or a container. So you can work on either of those types or those kind of concepts, if you will, because they all implement uh, the, uh, the concept called range. And so here's a few uh, concrete examples. So I'm creating a bunch of numbers, and uh, well, apparently uh, twice, and uh, <laughs> Uh, and then we can see here I can use the sort algorithm. This is not using any view because I need to work with items that I own. So it's doing a sort there. And then I can do stuff like views filter. So views filter is a function <coughs> from the uh, STD uh, ranges views namespace, which also has an alias for STD views. That's why I can use simply views. I'm assuming there's using namespace STD somewhere uh, up there. So within views, there are a bunch of functions uh, such as filter. And filter accepts, well, something, a predicate, in fact. There is such a concept even that accepts the object and returns a Boolean saying, do I want this thing in the final result or not? So this is the, the classic uh, predicate that returns a Boolean. So in this case, what I'm saying is that I want to get only the, the even numbers from this sequence. So if I go ahead and display now the result here, so when I just write the first line here, the result here just holds an object that knows how to do the work, but it's not doing anything yet. When I call display, now iteration begins, now the actual stuff is happening. So if I change the source, the numbers, before actually using the result, that would uh, change the result, even though it looks like I've already Take, take the result, I haven't yet used that, so it's still in a limbo state in a way. It hasn't happened just yet. So if I change the source and then look at the result, that change uh, is going to be reflected. Even though it looks like I've already done the work, I haven't really. Only display actually does the work. So then I can chain these things together. I have this result, I can chain that to a transform, that's another view, that provides something that is usually called projection. With projection, we take something from one, uh, in one way and give that and, and create a different thing. Could be a different type even, something that is different in some way. So in this case, I'm keeping the type. I'm taking every integer and just, uh, double, uh, just multiplying it by itself, squaring it. Uh, but I could have changed that to something completely different, like a string or some other structure, or whatever you want. So that would be a projection. And then I have another thing that I'm piping there, which is reverse, yet another one of these views when I'm reversing the order. So it's very easy to work uh, with that, and this is what we get if we run uh, these particular pieces of code. And by the way, all the code will be available for you to download if you want to, uh, to try it out. Um, so these are views, very, very powerful, very easy to use. You can chain these things together and do some, whatever you, you want to do. And so here's a partial list 
we'll keep questions to the end, okay? Um, so here's the partial list of, uh, of functions that create views, and of course the underlying function returns a type, so you can see the type in the second column. This is a partial list, it's not all there is there, but uh, gives you a sense of the power of this. So I can reverse, I can take stuff while something is uh, true, I can drop uh, things, so I, I can say the first few items, I don't want them, I want the next items, and of course we can combine them uh, by chaining them as we see fit. So essentially, well, bug in the animation, um, we can uh, use the chain operator uh, to chain stuff, of course, as we see here, but in fact, this is just a syntactic sugar, um, and we can always use the actual functions um, in the correct order, but notice that the order is logically reversed. So if I want to do something like filter and then take while, uh, the way to, to write it with the OR operator, with the chaining operator, is very easy. I want to filter, and then whatever re remains, I would like to uh, do something else with it and to just uh, take all those that co confirm to a certain condition. But if I want to write that with function style, just call the functions, I can do that, but notice that the order is reversed because I have to do first the filter, so it has to be an inner function. And so uh, the outer function will be take while, and that's going to accept the... Uh, the inner function, which is, uh, which is filter. So it's kind of backwards. And this is, again, the, one of the benefits of functional style. You're writing whatever you're thinking. So saying, I want to filter this, and then I want to take this, and then I want to do that, and, and this, so I'm just chaining the operators. If I would write the functions, I have to write that in the opposite order, which is kind of uh, more difficult to kind of think about. And, and that's another kind of... Uh, advantage to using this functional style and using the chain operator, but I'm just saying this is syntactic sugar. So if you want to uh, use the function, it's perfectly fine. So here's some more examples. I mean, playing with integers is nice, uh, but of course in real world, uh, things that we actually do, we rarely play with integers. Maybe some people do, but we want to, wor to work with more complex objects, and so it's, it's not really a problem. So here's another example. Let's say I work with some process objects, whatever those object may, objects may mean. So I have some structure representing uh, this type that I need to work with. And maybe I have uh, some function here that would allow me to, uh, to work with this, uh, to display uh, this kind of thing by overloading the, the stream uh, out operator. By the way, notice the function std format. This is one of my best uh, uh, friends lately in C++20, one of the nicest things that C++ should have had in day one. So it allows you to do printf-like stuff, but in a much uh, better way. So all languages have those. Now C++ has that, has that as well. So std format, your new best friend. All these uh, operators like uh, you use with C out and all these things, that's, that's bad. Uh, I never like those. I always use printf, in fact. Don't tell anyone. Ah, recorded, sorry. And uh, now with CD format, that solves everything. So please use CD, uh, CD format. This is just one way of using that. You have these placeholders, and everything you put after that will be there. And you can format stuff, and you can use ind indices, so you don't have to put uh, values in, the, in, the, in, in the, the specific order that you want, and so on. Lots of good stuff. Uh, so kind of something that I probably should mention. Uh, so here's another function that just displays a range, and this is just uh, kind of to set up the backdrop. And now we can uh, do stuff with these objects. Let's say I have this function called enum processes that returns a vector of these process info data structures. So these are not integers, these are more complex types, and I need to do stuff with these things. So for example, I can just display all of them, that's easy. Uh, and then I want to get all the processes that are not in session zero, whatever that may mean, doesn't really matter for our purposes. So I'm just taking uh, the, the processes and, and just chaining that to the filter view. The only thing that I don't like uh, with, with this is just something that is missing from C++ at this point. When you have a single expression, you still have in the lambda, you still have to write return, something, uh, semicolon, this is like, very annoying. Uh, I would like the, the way it works in C Sharp, in Rust, in other languages where you just write the expression and that's it. Uh, that would make things really 
better uh, in terms of the way we work with views and ranges. Uh, we don't have that in C++, unfortunately. I don't know why, uh, but I definitely would want that uh, to enter the language, especially now that ranges and views exist. Because this is going to be very common to do, and adding all these ceremony of these, uh, of these things is not very uh, nice. So I can take the result and put that into a container, for example. I can do that. Because if I'm going to do things like to sort stuff, I have to work with a container. There's no view that knows how to sort. And we need to have some kind of ownership there. And so I can sort. Then I can continue uh, working uh, with other, other types of views as I need. So here's, for example, another variation of sort that I haven't shown you uh, yet. If you just use sort with some collection, such as a vector, of course, the std less operator will be used there automatically by default by the compiler. And of course, this thing without anything else will fail to compile because the process info data structure doesn't overload uh, the less than operator which std less uses behind the covers. So I could, of course, do that by overloading that operator, but it's not always feasible. It might be a type that I didn't write. I don't have control over that type. So one way that uh, the, these algorithms allow us to do that is to uh, provide here some projection function. So this projection function says without, with this process info, whatever that may be, what actually you want to use as a comparison. If that thing has a less than operator, the compiler is happy to take that. So I'm saying here the sort should be about the process name. I'm returning here the uh, particular, the process name. The process name is a W string, which has a less than operator, which the compiler is happy to use. If I want to be very explicit about it, I can use the second parameter. So the second parameter here, which I'm specifying here as an empty object, is really something I can say, okay, I'll tell you how to compare these things. I will return a Boolean there, telling you which given two process info object, which one is, uh, is less than the other. So it is possible to do that in this way if the condition is more complex and it's not easy to uh, describe that using just a, a simple projection. And again, we can continue with these things by using another filter. Transformation. In this transformation, for example, I'm changing types. That's the classic projection. I'm starting with process info, but the result would be a simple process, a different data structure that has these uh, three members that I'm initializing here. And, and, and so what we get here in the result is a different thing. We started with something. We get a collection of something else, a view of something else. And of course, we can continue those, that in, in any way we see fit. That's the basic idea of using views. We can use them with any types that we want, and it's fairly easy to use and work with them. Another thing that is provided in the ranges uh, library is something called range factories. So range factories allow you to create, um, to create views on demand based on some, uh, some factors, some kind of uh, spe special way. Not necessarily, not by having an, an existing, um, an existing collection or an existing view. So uh, one example would be a single view. If you want to have a view with a single item, what do you need to do that? Instead of trying to create something like a vector and then putting a single item and, and trying to extract a view from that, that's kind of icky. And so you have this single view that returns a view that simply contains that uh, single item, which you can, of course, then chain to other operators on and give that to anyone that requires the view. And there's the IOTA view or the IOTA function that allows you to create a potentially infinite sequence of uh, integer numbers and then simply do something with them as, as the view, as these numbers come in. So here's a simple example of that. We have a call here to the IOTA function. We get a range of integers between 1 and 100. So this is lazily provided uh, to, the, to the view. So it's not something like a vector now being created or anything. This is just bringing us one number at a time. And for that, I'm doing some form of transformation, filtering, whatever, it doesn't matter. It works like any other uh, view. So here's the result for this particular case. I'm taking number 1 to 100, multiplying everyone by 2, and then only taking those that are divisible by 3. So this is the result that I get. All the divisible numbers by 3 that are uh, in the range 2 to 200, um, only the even, the even numbers. So these are views. These are ranges. A very simple, relatively simple feature to use, but still very powerful, and I hope these things would, would be extended 
in, uh, in subsequent versions of, of C++. Um, and especially I would like the, the way to express lambda, ex lambda functions with a single expression to be simpler than it is today. So now we're moving to definitely my favorite feature, uh, probably the most complex uh, to understand in C++20, which is the coroutines. So this was uh, uh, something that I encountered, again, back in, in .NET a lot. Uh, .NET had support for some forms of coroutines in .NET 2 using the yield return statement for those who are familiar with uh, C Sharp. And uh, then other stuff came along in C Sharp 5 that allowed you to perform asynchronous operation as though they were synchronous in the sense that the simplicity of writing the code uh, really uh, gives you lots of power and ease of use. So behind the scenes, crazy things might happen and they do in C++ as well. But in most cases, developers don't need to understand that, don't need to know the details in order to use this very powerful feature. So let me start with some motivation. Why would I want something like a coroutine? What is a coroutine anyway? We don't know just yet, at least not from, from this uh, se session, but let's start with something. So let's say I want to calculate uh, uh, a range of prime numbers um, f to get a pr prime numbers vector from a range of numbers starting with first and last. And yes, I do like prime numbers, unfortunately. So uh, here's one way to do that, it's very easy. I just create a vector and then uh, call the is prime now very famous function. And whenever I find a prime number, I add that to the vector and then return the vector uh, from the function. I mean, what could be simpler? The problem here is that uh, the user of that function might call the function with various numbers. So it can use something like three and 1,000 and then just decide to display uh, the numbers, uh, which is fine. And it works just fine. However, what happens if I use a very big number and I want at some point to exit the loop? I'm printing, printing these numbers or doing something with these numbers and at some point I want to break out of the loop. So in this particular case, I'm just showing something as an example. If n is greater than 500, this is of course something I can know in compile time and say, well, I don't really need to, uh, to go all the way to that crazy number. Let's just do something much smaller. But assume you have a very complex condition here which is only available at runtime. You don't know beforehand when you might want to break out of the loop, if at all. And the problem is that if you run this code and uh, even with this particular case, a very simple case, when n is greater than 500, you find that it's going to take a while for the application for this loop to exit. And the problem should be fairly obvious. The problem is that we're going and doing all this crazy work of calculating all the prime numbers in the range from three to 10 million or whatever before we return the first number. So we're doing lots of work with potentially very little benefit because the client, the consumer of the result is not necessarily interested in all that stuff. And we can't know that in advance because this is something dynamic. This is something that happens at runtime. So this is bad. We're consuming lots of memory, using lots of CPU time that might not be re really used. If the user doesn't, if the client doesn't uh, get out of the loop, then yes, we'll use everything. But who knows? We want something more dynamic in that respect. So that's the problem. How can we say to the function, hey, give me the next prime number. I want another one. Now give me another one. Okay, I'm done, I don't need any more. We want to have something like this, which means that if you want to write such a function, we can't really return a vector. There's no way to do that because a vector is a done deal. All the numbers are there, that's it. If I return a vector, that's it. There's no way to kind of extend that later on. At least not, not in just very simple function call way. So this is one example where coroutines come in. So how do I do that? How do I make this work in the way that I want? By requesting every time one thing and one thing only. And I can exit at any point in time. So here's that, what that might look like. So we have this function. In, and that function calc primes 2 is not returning a vector. 
we can't return a vector. There's no way to do that uh, to get the, the functionality that we want. So I'm going to return something different. Let's call that generator of int. And for now, we don't know what this thing is, but I want to start with the client perspective. What the consumer needs to do in order for this to work, uh, sorry, the, the implementation needs to do in order for this to work. And we'll look at the client in a moment. So here's what that looks like. What I'm doing here, there is no vector. I'm not interested in storing these numbers anyway. I just want to give them back one at a time when they are requested. So what I'm doing here, I'm using a loop, the normal loop we've seen previously. But now if I get a prime number, I'm using a new keyword called co-yield. I'm saying called yield i. Well, that's definitely very understandable. Um, and of course, I have to explain a lot of stuff to understand what that actually does. But conceptually, what we have here is a resumable function. A function that says, okay, I'm done. I'm going to save my state. I know where I am. I'm giving back that result, that i, with the co-yield uh, keyword. And the next time I'm going to get called, I'm going to resume from the same location and just continue execution. So the state is saved in some way. So all the local variables are saved. And then we just resume from the same location going to the next iteration of the loop. And if you try this out with the debugger, you'll see this is exactly what is happening. The debugger, at most debuggers at least, will give you the, the correct impression. So we're going to go back to the caller function, do stuff with that value, and then you'll go further back, well, back, back, to the original function do another work for the next prime number, and then go back to the consumer and back and forth. So we have a function which can be suspended and resumed later on, which is crazy. We don't really know these kinds of functions. There is no such function, which also probably means that what we see there as that looks like a function, it's not really a function. It can't be a function. We don't know how to stop a function mid-flight and say, hey, what? Uh, just return now and just uh, keep track of where we are. I'll get back to you. So it means that we have some sort of transformation here that the compiler must do for this thing to give us the behavior that we want. That can't really be a function. And technically, this is known as a coroutine. So any function that has one of these keywords, uh, co-yield is one of them, is actually not a real function, it's not a normal function, it's a different kind of beast called a coroutine. On the consumer side, in this case, it's very easy. I'm just using uh, calc primes here, calc primes two, in a range for, in the range for loop. So of course this means that this generator thing, whatever that may be, also confirms to the concept of being able to be used by a range for loop. So it probably has a begin iterator that returns an iterator, an end function returns an iterator, it has a plus plus operator and so on. So we probably can guess some aspects of what that generator is. But not all of, the, of those aspects for sure. So what is that generator anyway? How do we write that kind of generator? And this is currently the problem with C++20. C++20 provides all the necessary, necessary kind of work done by the compiler to transform our functions to coroutines in a certain way, but it doesn't provide any concrete implementations for things that could conform to, that, to these kinds of concepts, that could conform to that and be able to, we can be able to plug them in. The generator I'm showing here, I'm using here, is in fact, as you can probably guess from the way it's uh, written, it's from a namespace called experimental. This is in particular being provided by the Microsoft uh, C++ compiler. So they have uh, uh, this generator of T type that provides uh, an example implementation of a generator, thing that can work with this coil. It also implements the iterator trait, so we can iterate over that. Uh, because the standard doesn't provide these kinds of types in C++20. I, my guess is they will be provided in the next standard. And the reason for that is that, as we'll see, we we'll kind of get a sense of that in the next uh, few slides, this thing is, is fairly complex. It's fairly complex to implement, 
and uh, it, it, it's very flexible. You can implement things in, in very different ways. So the, the committee decided that they don't have enough information uh, to provide implementations. They can say, well, that's a good thing. That's a good implementation. We want everyone to use this and that and that implementation. Don't, they decided it's not, uh, it's not mature enough. They don't know exactly the use cases uh, in, in kind of 100% uh, or very, uh, very high probability. So you want to gain more experience to see how people are using uh, these core routines uh, functionality and provide and creating their own types uh, that confirm uh, confirm to this uh, to these concepts before actually providing um, implementation. So this is an example provided by Microsoft that uh, gives us the way to use this generator without having to write a single piece of code. So the the, the easy part here, I just took that generator. I don't care how it's built inside, but I can just use it. I can now use it in any function and call core yield whenever I need to, to provide a number or value, whatever, to the caller. And then the caller, if it calls me again, I'm going to do the next item of work. So it's very efficient. It's very low memory consumption. We're not building a vector of anything. We're just doing the next item if the client requests that. That's one very uh, powerful example of a core routine. So what is a core routine? Technically speaking, a core routine is any function that has one of these keywords in its body. That's core weight, core return, and core yield that we've seen in the previous slide. So each one has a different, a different meaning, of course. Core return is about ending a core routine, saying, okay, we're done. I don't have any more to give you. So in the previous example, we had this loop, and you can think of the end of the loop as having a core return, saying, okay, that's it. We don't have any more data for you because these kinds of data streams could be potentially infinite. Maybe I'm going to get information from the internet about uh, stock values. So stock values are happening all the time. At some point I can say, well, there are no more. Or some weather information or whatever. So core return is about the opposite. It's like return. But return is actually uh, something you cannot use in a core routine. Once you have a core routine, the return statement itself is, in, is illegal. Core return is the, the thing to use. Core weight is something I'll, I'll discuss uh, in, in the next few slides to give you a sense of what that is. So because core routines is a fairly comp complex uh, subject, especially if you try to implement uh, supported types that can work with, with the core routine infrastructure, um, I, my point here is to just to give you mostly the intuition about it or the motivation why we would want to have something like this. And the ba basic idea is that I want to, uh, so one example is generators. Another example is asynchronous programming or asynchronous things that I want to do. A classic example would be in I operation. When you're doing I operation, normally we call some API, like a read or write or whatever we're using, and then the thread is blocked. It's not doing anything while the I operation is in play. And that's a waste. Creating threads that are doing nothing, that's wasteful. We want to create threads that do work. So what we can do, we can perform the operation asynchronously. We can say, hey, let's start the I operation. Let's do other stuff in the meantime. And when that's done, let's pick up the result and continue. But how do we do that? Then we get into trouble because the APIs or functions or whatever to work with asynchronous operations make things much more complex. Now you have to provide a callback or wait on something in some other thread perhaps. It makes your code much more complex if you want to gain that performance benefit of threads doing work so you can, that thread can return and serve some other client perhaps or some other request. So it makes things much more complex. And many developers say, well, that's too complex. Let's just do the synchronous call. Hopefully it won't take too long. But that's, of course, prob problematic if you want to have true scalability. So with the aid of core routines, we can invoke asynchronous operation in a simple, simple fashion, just like synchronous operations. But they will work asynchronously, provided that we have the proper support. And now we have the proper support by the compiler. And we need to provide the proper support for the types that would plug into the workflow that the compiler creates or expects uh, things, the way things to work. So what is a core routine? It's a resumable function. Function we can suspend 
and then resume later on. That's the basic idea. It, the C++ 20 functions, the coroutines, they are known as stackless. And uh, the way to understand that is if we go back to this function, I'm doing a yield there. So what happens to the state of the function? The variables that are created on the stack, such as i, they can't be on the stack anymore, or at least it would be very difficult to maintain them on the stack in, in some way because the function is, should return. There's a really a return there. It returns to the caller, which means that in many cases, in most cases, these variables have to be lifted to the heap. They have to be heap allocated to maintain that state. So this is done by the compiler. We don't have to worry about that. What we need to understand that something happens here. The function, as we see here, is not really the way it looks at all. The compiler has to do something with it uh, to make this work, and that's why it requires compiler support, because now local variables can't be local anymore, at least not in most cases. Okay, so uh, within a core routine, like I said, uh, the return statement is illegal. Some functions cannot be coroutines. So for example, constructors and destructors can't be coroutines. Why? Anybody? They don't return anything. That's a problem. You have to return something that would allow the, the caller to do something. With that, you can't return a void or, or nothing. And so constructors and destructors can't be coroutines. If you want to invoke a coroutine from a constructor, for instance, you have to create a helper function for that. Um, if you really want to do that, probably you should avoid that because the constructor will be ending prematurely and you continue to, to kind of try to perhaps initialize the object. So there's some complexities that could be there, definitely. And there are some other limitations on coroutines, but they're not too bad. So periodic templates and code seval and constant expression functions can't be coroutines because the transformations done by the compiler cannot really adhere to these uh, const expression, const eval um, uh, concepts and, and ideas. So here's another generator example, just to show you how easy it is to do. Once you have this generator type, it's very easy to do. So here, for example, is a, a test application that tries to get uh, numbers from the Fibonacci series. And in this case, what I'm doing, I'm saying, hey, let's do that uh, with a concept, with some integral, unsigned integral. And notice that here we have a breaking, uh, an, an option to break out of the loop at any point in time, which we cannot foresee in advance. The user has to press the Q uh, key in order to, to get out. So we don't know when that would happen, if at all. So we don't want to calculate everything, we want to get one at a time. So here's our generator. Notice how easy it is to write. So I'm returning another generator of T, because in this case I, I need to be more generic, so I'm going to return generator of T. Again, I'm using the same type provided by Microsoft here, but of course I could write it my, myself. I'll show an example of what that looks like. I just don't want to, to scare you uh, very early here. And so uh, if the, the count is zero, I'm just using call return. There's nothing me, more for me to give. And then the first number in Fibonacci series is one. You want another number? Great. Here's another one for you. You want another number? Okay, now I'm going to get into a loop and calculate the next number by taking A and adding that to B, that would be C, and return C. And by using coil. So here I'm suspending the function, maintaining state, returning to the caller. If the caller would call me again, great. If not, fine. I don't really mind. If it calls me again, I'm going to continue by using A equals B, B equals C, and calculate the next number, and so on. So of course the Fibonacci series is not a great example of of coroutine because the calculation is very cheap. But still, the idea applies and the, the example with the prime numbers is, is a good example because calculating prime, prime numbers is not necessarily cheap. So that's one uh, usage of, uh, of coroutines. So you might be wondering what that generator might look like. So again, it might be a bit scary. So here's just to give you a sense of what that thing looks like. And the basic idea here is to plug into something the compiler expects. The compiler expects a certain uh, thing to, uh, to implement certain aspects. It's like a concept. It's just like a concept saying you have to have these members. Without these members, I can't really use my code to plug into your code. So the basic idea here, so I'm not 
Well, I'm not going to go into that just yet. I will show some aspects of that uh, a bit later. But what we see here is something called a coroutine handle. Coroutine handle is the object the compiler uses to manage the life of the coroutine and manage all the stuff within it. And we can use that thing to, uh, to actually uh, invoke uh, the rest of the coroutine, the rest of the function. Because if you think about it, when you call it co-yield, for instance, you get back, you return something, but then the state is saved. But you can think of that as the function being broken into several parts, everything up to the co-yield, and then everything after that. So that everything after that needs to be invoked at some point. But the compiler has no idea when to do that because it doesn't really know what I'm trying to do. Maybe it's an I operation and that should be all these things should be invoked when the I operation completes, maybe in, in 10 seconds. The compiler has no idea. So what the compiler does is generates for me a kind of lambda, a function, that represents the rest of the code and says, hey, here it is. Call it when it is appropriate. In the case of the generator here, I'm not actually suspending anything. I'm just giving things back and there's nothing uh, specially uh, to, to suspend here. So here's what happens when the next function is called. So this is not the implementation of the previous generator I've shown you. This is a different implementation. And this is simpler, where you need to call the next function to get the next item. And I didn't uh, bother to implement here the iterator tra uh, trait. If you want, you can try to do that. Um, so you have to actually use a normal for loop and just call next every time you want another number. So that's the generator you're working with. And what I need to do here is to resume uh, the next the next item in the, uh, so resume the, the code. So the compiler gives me that handle that's an opaque data structure that represents uh, some aspects that it's managing. One of them is the rest of the code after the co yield or the co await in, in other cases. I need to, to uh, invoke that because the compiler will do, not do it itself. It doesn't really know when, when, I should, when that should run. So resume is a method to invoke that. Also the operator of uh, parentheses is available to do that. So you can just go ahead and invoke that object. Uh, and then uh, when, uh, when this is, well, let's, let's, uh, let's keep it uh, simple for now. We have this promise type, as you can see there at the top, and this is one of the requirements. So every wrapper, this is, you can think of that as the kind of the manager of the coroutine, must have a nested type called promise type. And that promise type represents the, the value that is sort of being uh, reported back in the case of co-yield. So promise T is just a holder of uh, a T type of object. And this also must conform to certain operations. So just to, again, to, to give you a sense of what that looks like and the sense of the complexities that are involved, and this is why I'm saying uh, you should probably not write coroutine managers yourself, but try to find an impl implementations that already exist and doing the right thing for your scenario. But it is possible to write them as I, I've done. And so again, this is the promise type and has some members that are necessary. Are necessary because the compiler is looking for them and if they're missing, it simply won't compile the code. Again, it kind of plugs into it. And I think the best way to learn about it is to use a debugger and test these things out. So for instance, uh, here's an example of using this generator, the simpler generator. So I'm using a while loop here. I can't use for the range for uh, loop because I didn't implement the iterator kind of trait for that, uh, for that generator. And the way I'm doing that, the way I'm returning back values, I'm returning values until I have nothing to give and I'm reporting that as an optional of n. So saying that there's nothing else. And so, I added uh, a trace, a simple uh, C out in all the uh, members of the generator and promise, and you can see the sequence of operations happening uh, by looking at what the compiler is actually invoking at every stage of the way. So of course you can read all that in the C++ standard, so good luck with that. But this is, I think, easier. You can see what's happening, and if you're using a debugger, you can just set up breakpoints and see which is calling which. Of course, it's not going to give you the full picture, because the compiler generates other code in the background, such as that something called coroutine frame, which holds on to that local state and other stuff the compiler needs to track uh, in that respect. And there's also, of course, other complexities, such as what happens if there's an exception. But it's all, it's all there. It's all in the standard. There's, there's methods to, to be invoked when there's 
an exception. All these things are covered. It's just a matter of writing these types uh, correctly. So essentially, what is a quarantine? There's some transformation that is happening, and this is some contract between the compiler and the implementation. Here's uh, the gist of it, kind of the simplest way of looking at it. Unfortunately, it's incomplete. So you're writing a function that contains co-weight, uh, co-yield, or co-return, or any combination of those, a uh, good combination of those, hopefully. Then you get a coroutine. Now your function is a coroutine. It's not really a normal function anymore. And so the compiler needs to do, do some transformation. This is the basic transformation it does. Your function is in purple there. That's the thing that you wrote. As you can see, the compiler turns that into something else, which is, I'm saying it's incom incomplete. Why? Because there's co-weight there. So there's co-weight. So the next question should be, what does that co-weight do anyway? Because the function initial suspend and, and, uh, and final suspend use co-weight, which means uh, I have to kind of peel that onion and say, what's in there? What's the co-weight actually doing? So it's uh, perhaps a bit recursive. That's why I'm saying it's not the complete picture. So what happens, you can see here, first the compiler creates the promise object. That's the promise type we have to provide inside the, our wrapper coroutine. And then it calls initial suspend, and that should return something which is awaitable. That would be the topic of our next slide. So that's why co-await is on it. But essentially it means should I, should I suspend initially when the coroutine starts execution or not? So I can suspend if I want to, or say that I want to continue. So I need to return something that tells the compiler whether I want to suspend or not. And we'll, we'll expand on that uh, in a moment. And then runs the function body. And, uh, and then, uh, again, the final suspend is going to be called after everything is done. And of course, the function body can contain code weights and, and all, all this stuff, which, which brings more code that has to run. Like, I'm, like I said, it's, it's not really that easy. So um, let me talk about awaiters. It will give you some more context about the slide we just saw. I know it's uh, perhaps a bit uh, more complex than we uh, hoped. So I see we're a bit short on time, and I'll try to move these things along. So normally, this is synchronous call. It's very easy to do. We call a function, we wait, we get a result. If it's an IR operation, for example, we use the result, very easy. In an asynchronous call, we need to provide some form that says, hey, here's something to, to call once you're done. Maybe it's a lambda, maybe some function, maybe it's a different mechanism, doesn't matter, but at least now, I can uh, do other stuff in between, and that's the point. So if I have multiple operations, that makes things even worse. So if I want to uh, perform two operations in sequence, maybe the same time, I can't synchronously. I have to perform one, wait until it's over, perform the second. Uh, on the other hand, I can do several things at the same time very quickly, and the result will come in sooner for the second operation at least. And asynchrony, by the way, doesn't mean threats. Many people associate asynchrony with threats. This is not strictly correct. Asynchrony is, uh, can be accomplished with threats, but this is just one option. And in fact, with I.O., it's not needed. I.O. doesn't need any thread to maintain operations. This is where we can really benefit by not waiting, by doing other stuff, serving other clients uh, while the I.O. operation is in play. Nothing needs to kind of hold on to that. This is done by the hardware. These things don't require anything to, to hold that together. And so for several scenarios, asynchrony is the key to scalability. Without that, you'd be very limited because if you have a thread doing I operation and then it's just blocking, another request comes in, another thread has to come to, to serve that, which is wasteful. Um, so let's see. In general, what we can do with that is use awaiters. Awaiters are objects that uh, implement or adhere to a certain concept called the, waitable, the waiter concept. They have these three methods. And because we're a bit short on time, let me show you an example of how we can use that in a, in a very nice way. So here's an example of a delay awaiter. A delay awaiter is something that allows us to have a, a delay, like uh, sleep, but not really by making the thread not do anything, the thread can do other stuff, and then after the sleep is over, some code can continue execution. So we're not really stopping for anything, but we do need to 
uh, to pause the current sequence of operations, but we can do other stuff in between. So here's how to implement an awaiter. It must have these three functions, and to make things a bit easier, I'm using the suspend always, which is one of those two uh, awaiters that are provided by the standard library, which, has, which are kind of trivial awaiters. One of them always uh, suspends, and the other one never suspends. And the uh, most interesting function is always await suspend. So what I'm doing here, I'm creating another thread. This is not the best option, but for this example, it's going to be good enough. I get this uh, coroutine handle provided by the compiler to me. I'm slipping for the number of milliseconds that I am requested to. And then using coro here, I'm actually invoking or resuming the function. So I have no idea what, what the rest of the code is. I don't care. The compiler knows. It kind of bundles all that code into that coroutine handle and simply invoking that. So essentially, after that delay, that code will be invoked, but on a different thread. So maybe I want that, maybe I don't want that. That's what would happen here, which means that we have a function that is going to be kind of partially uh, using different threads. So here's an example when I'm using that. So I'm saying for wait, delay, one second. So after that one second, the next line will be executed by a different thread. And then I'm going to do it again, I'm going to execute the next time with a different thread yet again after a second. But in between, what happens? The function returns to the caller. And the caller can do anything else that it wants. So the thread is free to go to do other stuff. So it's not really pausing the thread. It's just pausing this function so the next line will not happen until one second passes. But in between, the thread is free. It went away already. At the core wait point, it's gone. It's gone and does other stuff. So I really wanted to run this for you to show you that uh, in practice, but you have the code, you can try that out yourself uh, later on. And by the way, here I'm using another helper, so the delay itself is a, just a wrapper class that has a core await operator, which is one of the ways to, to expose an await. So I know it's kind of complex uh, because it really needs its own talk, and uh, maybe uh, several talks even. So here's last example just to show you how I can use a real world example, not just something uh, very kind of contrived. So I want to do an asynchronous operation with Windows APIs. What I like Windows, as you probably know already. And so the, the thing is that to do that, I have to create an event object that will be signaled and wait for that in some other thread. And this is crazy. Instead, I want to do something which is very simple. Instead of calling read file, I want to call a read file async. And just when the result is ready, let's continue. In the meantime, let's return to the caller to do other stuff. So here's uh, what I would like to do. So this is how to do that, in fact. I'm using here some Windows APIs to register for an event object that's going to be signaled by the operation. And then I have to resume the operation just by calling, uh, by uh, invoking eventually the, uh, the actual coroutine here once the operation completes. And essentially, if I just use it, uh, regardless of how that, impl that implementation, some crazy guy or girl will do that, I don't care, so that I'm showing that uh, just to, to show you that it's possible and not actually too difficult once you get the hang of it. And uh, then now I can go ahead and use the read file async and use core wait on that and get the result back. But in between, the thread doesn't return. It returns to the caller doing other stuff. When the I operation is ready, only then the, the, the code will return. Yeah. So that's the basic idea, and, and you can do these things fairly easily. Once you get the hang of it, you can do these things fairly easily. And now you see that the call looks like a synchronous call, but it's actually, actually asynchronous. So it has the simplicity of something very simple, like calling a function, but it works asynchronously behind the covers. Okay, so uh, there's some other uh, stuff there, such as especially uh, there is an implementation here you can use. Uh, someone has already created many of those coroutine managers for various scenarios which you can use. So I recommend you start there if you want to use something which is already built. Like I said, it's missing from the standard time. Let me talk about modules very quickly and we'll end our session for today. So the basic idea that we have in C++ is those headers. That is used for uh, that are used for uh, sharing code and, and building applications, but really this is uh, not very efficient because if you have a certain header included by multiple CTP files, it's going to be compiled uh, multiple times, which is completely wasteful. 
it's the same header file after all. And this is just the way things work because of this compilation unit thing. So maybe I should switch to something else. I've done everything uh, today, so that would be another thing. <laughs> so in general, the basic idea is to try to fix that. There's also a dependency between headers. Sometimes you need to include them in the correct uh, order. There's other stuff that is leaking, such as macros. If you define a macro in some header, then now it's available to you when you include that header, even though you don't care about that macro. Maybe some implementation detail cares, but you don't. But you get that macro leaked out of that header file, which is definitely not ideal. So modules is really here to solve all these things. Here is an example of a module. A module uh, has a name, and it can export members. Could be classes, could be functions, anything that you want. And only the exported parts are available to clients. So client can do an import to import a certain module, and then it can use the functionality exported in the module. That's as simple as that. Nothing, very more, nothing much more complex than that. There are some other aspects like uh, partitions, but it's really just uh, a variation on the same idea. Because now the module is going to be compiled only once regardless of any number of compilation units using the same module. So you save compilation time. And it's also not leaking any macros. So here's a more uh, a complex example where I have a macro here called SQR. And that macro is part of this module, but it's not going to leak to clients. So it's going to be private to the module. So anybody does an import to that math module, it's not going to see this SQR a macro. It's completely invisible. It's just an implementation detail for the module. You can see here that some functions don't have the ex export uh, modifier, which means they are private to the module. They will not be visible to outsiders. And it, there's other syntaxes we can use, such as export and just curly braces and put everything in there. So there are some submodules and partitions that I'll let you see later on uh, on the slides. So in general, we have this uh, module linkage now that allows us to work with modules and get rid of all the header files. Header files are obsolete. So not really. We still have to use them and they still work as expected. But in fact, we can start by importing standard library headers as modules. You can do that. You can do import vector. Notice a semicolon at the end. This is not a preprocessor thing. This is a compiler thing. So there is a semicolon at the end. So we now can uh, import all standard library headers as, uh, as modules. Other headers may or may not work. Unfortunately, this is still compiler dependent. But at least the standard library, the standard mandates that this works. So that's it. C++ is, uh, is a big release, like I said. I think you're probably convinced of that if you haven't uh, previously. Uh, the demos will be available on the GitHub repository right here. I'm going to make it public in the next few minutes once I get uh, access to, to, to the web. And uh, I think the challenge here is to integrate these things into existing applications, uh, integrate these features. And it's usually uh, easy to integrate concepts and ranges because it kind of uh, flows into whatever we're doing, just making things a bit more uh, explicit. Uh, coroutines are more challenging but I think there's a big benefit there for code clarity and for efficiency. And modules probably be the most difficult part to integrate, although they're easiest to understand, probably the most uh, difficult to integrate with existing code bases with many header files and so on, but uh, hopefully that would be uh, easier with time. So thank you, if you have questions, just come, come up and I'll, I'll try to answer them. So thank you.